gather around and uh, start the um, second part of our service. Well, we're nearing the end of our study of Second Peter. This will be the second to last sermon. Um, and if you remember our message two Sundays ago, Peter turns now and begins to address the, the false teaching uh, head on. And the basic message last week was um, that God will, will judge the wicked, he'll preserve the righteous, and, and the false teachers were teaching something counter to that. And um, we're, as Christians, as Christ followers, we ought to pursue righteousness, not in an effort to earn our salvation, but as a natural result of being saved. That we're no longer defined by our sin, Rather, we're defined by grace. And so we make it a habit to confess and to turn from our sins. Well, this week, Peter continues his teaching. And now in chapter 3, he addresses the the second main proposition um, from the false teachers. And that was that Jesus was not going to come back to judge the world. Uh, Things will just go on as they always have. And when we die, our souls are saved, therefore it doesn't matter what we would do with our physical bodies. And so let's turn now uh, to 2 Peter chapter 3 as Peter addresses this false teaching. And if you remember, just like he did in chapter 2, I want you to notice that Peter takes the same approach as he did in chapter 2, going first to the Old Testament and expositing it and drawing from it a timeless truth. And then he goes to the teaching of Jesus and does the same thing and then applies it. And so um, we'll see uh, uh, that the authority of Scripture has to be where we begin with any teaching that, that we hear. So let's turn to 2 Peter 3, verses 1 to 13. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them... I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. Following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, All things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and that the earth was formed out of water, through water, by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, The heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance." But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens and the earth will pa- the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all of these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord? or the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this teaching. We thank you for your word. And Lord, as we look at the Old Testament promises, as we look at the teaching of Jesus, Lord, help us to be a people found waiting and ready for you. Lord, let us each live our lives as if you would be coming back this very hour. Let us live lives of full conviction and commitment to you. Let us 
live lives where you are the priority, that you are our Lord and our master. And so, Lord, use this scripture passage to make us ready. Use the teaching today through your Holy Spirit to empower us to live lives of readiness as we wait for your return. Lord, send your spirit upon us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we began the series with the statement that what you believe about the end will determine how you live your life today. And if you remember, uh, we began this series of messages with a couple of illustrations uh, to illustrate this uh, fact. Um, we began with that one illustration. There are two different airports called Frankfurt, Hahn, and they're about 90 minutes apart from one another. And there are two different destinations with two very different paths to get there. What you believe about the end will determine how you get there and the path you take. Similarly, I mentioned my two sons who are almost completed with their driver's license and how this goal of getting a driver's license just inspired them to be administrative kings and uh, get all the little nitpicking, bureaucratic German things done uh, with amazing speed. I've never seen them uh, act with such... uh, (laughs) Whatever. (laughs) All right. So... But, but, but both of those kind of illustrate the point. What you believe about the end really determines how you live your life today. And we know it's true. It's commonly said. What you, um, if you knew that today would be your last day, uh, how would you live this day differently than normal? And, that, and that's the question Peter is challenging the false teachers and us. Are we living today in light of what's going to happen in eternity? If Christ came back today... Would you be ready? And that's, that's what the passage is asking us this morning. You know, as Christians, we are to be last day people. Living this day as if the Lord would come back at any time. And what we believe about the end determines how we live our lives today. The false teachers mocked the apostles' teaching about the return of Christ. And Peter will now address them and, and turn to them directly. They mocked the idea, oh, it's taking so long. Things will just go on as they always have. Uh, Jesus was wrong about his return. You're wrong about his return. What's really important is that our souls are saved. It doesn't matter what we do with our bodies. And they lived very immoral lives. And so Peter goes to the Old Testament, and he breaks down his argument in this way. He begins with the Old Testament. He goes, look at the power of God's word and what it tells us. He's acted in judgment before. He's going to come and act in judgment again. In verses 8 to 10, we have the promise of God's word in Jesus' teaching that Jesus has an eternal plan, and he's not coming back until it it is the right time. In verse 11 to 13, uh, he'll apply that word, and that is really we're going to focus more on next week. We wouldn't have time today to get into all of it. So... um, Let's walk through Peter's argument together, beginning with verses 1 to 4, which kind of sets the context and the scene for us. This is the second letter I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord, our Lord and Savior, through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing, following their own deceitful desires, and they'll say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. And here Peter begins by echoing what he's already said at the close of chapter 1. If you remember, we have the Old Testament witness. We have uh, the teachings of Jesus passed on to us through the apostles. So for us, that means we have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament. And Peter calls upon this dual witness in verse 5, and he calls this the word of God. And so you see in verse 1 and 2, he writes again as an intro to his argument, I'm stirring up your mind to remember these things, to go back to Scripture, to go back to what we've been taught, what's been revealed by God to us in his word. And so we have this faithful witness of the Old Testament. We have the teaching of the apostles as the foundation of our beliefs 
for our knowledge of God. And through the knowledge of God, we learn that we have divine power that will equip us for everything that we need for anything that we face. And so Peter models for the early church and for us that when we are confronted with any teaching, that we are to use scripture as the rule or the standard by which everything is measured. And so Peter goes to the Old Testament. He goes to the New Testament witness of Christ as the basis for how he engages that false teaching. And that is a lesson for us that we need to go to God's revealed word when we're confronted with any type of teaching to know the truth and the validity of what we're hearing. And then in verses three and four, Peter describes what the false teachers are saying. They're they're basically saying, this is taking too long. This promise was an empty promise. Uh, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, things are just going to continue as they are. And you can almost hear modern critiques of Christianity in this, right? It's essentially a naturalistic view of history. And so in these opening four verses, Peter sets the stage for his argument. He gives a little bit of context. He says, we're going to go first to the scriptural witness. Remember these things. And then he summarizes their mocking the argument, uh, mocking the teaching of the second coming. So first Peter goes to the Old Testament. Look in verses five to seven. For they deliberately overlook, and here some of your translations might say deliberately forget. So that's an interesting way of phrasing it. I think I deliberately forgot yesterday that my wife had a whole list of chores that I was supposed to be doing, right? To deliberately forget something is a little bit of a uh, counterintuitive thing. But Paul teaches us in Romans that we uh, suppress the truth. That's in our sinful nature to suppress the the truth. So they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and that the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. If you remember in Genesis 1, that God came and he took the waters of chaos and, and made land and water and light. And that's where it begins. And that by means of these, the world existed. It was deluged with water and perished, the story of Noah. And by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly, that great and terrible day of the Lord that the prophets spoke of. So notice how he speaks of the power of the word of God. Verse 5, the earth was formed by the word of God. Verse six, the earth was deluged with water in judgment by the word of God. And verse seven, that same word, by that same word, the world will be judged by fire. So here Peter draws on the word of God and the power of the word of God, recalling that it's through the word of God that God created. It's by the word of God that God judged the world through the flood. And it will be through that same word that the Lord will come again in judgment. So who is that word? It's Jesus Christ is the word of God made flesh. And so we base our teaching and life on this powerful word of God. And the false teachers scoffed at the idea that the world was gonna come to an end in judgment. Peter recalls for them that God has already done this at one point in history through the flood. And in the prophets, he said he would come again in fiery judgment on the great and terrible day of the Lord. And so Peter goes to scripture as the precedent, as the basis for his argument. The fact that there was a great flood is documented, not just in scripture, but in several ancient historical records from the Babylonian to early African, even Peru and Mexican traditions were called a great flood of cataclysmic proportions. Now this is an aside, but I love when science confirms uh, the mechanics of scripture. So bear with me with a second. For years, scientists assumed that water that we have on earth came in a massive asteroid from, from ice and it kind of introduced water to the earth. And that, that may potentially still be true. And this, on this theory, for, for years, scientists mocked the biblical record that states that during the flood, God released a deep springs from within the earth's core flooding the entire earth, or parts of the earth, whatever your interpretation is. Well, about 10 years ago, 
science, with the help of technology, drilled past the Earth's outer core and made a fascinating discovery. For the better part of the last century and a half, scientists had thought Earth's core oceans were formed when icy comets hit the planet. But new research suggests a different origin for the oceans. They simply seeped out of the center of the Earth. After decades of searching, scientists have discovered that a vast reservoir of water, enough to fill the oceans three times over, may be trapped hundreds of miles beneath the surface, potentially transforming our understanding of how the planet was formed. So look, look how Moses describes the flood in Genesis 7. And this is what was mocked as implausible. But 3,000 years before this scientific discovery, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventh day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were open. The word of God is powerful, revealing to us deep things about God. And Peter goes to that word as trustworthy and true place to base our knowledge of God, of the world, and of humanity. And Peter writes in verse 5 that these false teachers deliberately overlook this fact, deliberately forget this, meaning that in the hubris, in, in the pride of sinful humanity, they disregard God's word and seek for other explanations to deliberately forget something is what we call selective memory. So in their pride, the false teachers disregard Scripture's teaching. And so from the Old Testament witness, Peter reminds us that what we are clearly taught in the Old Testament, and here's the timeless biblical truth that he pulls out, just as God judged the ancient world by water, he will come again on a day called the day of the Lord, and he will judge the world for all their iniquities and sins in, in fire. So just look at places like Isaiah 66, 15 to 16, for just one of these Old Testament examples. For behold, the Lord will come in fire, and his chariots like the whirlwind, to render his anger and fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment, and by his sword with all flesh, and those slain by the Lord shall be many. So Peter goes first to the Old Testament, exposits a timeless truth that undermines the claims of the false teachers and then applies that to their teaching. Will things just go on forever, they scoff? No, there is a great and terrible day of judgment coming. But then why the delay? Why not just come now and end it all? Why all this misery and suffering? Why this wait? Why doesn't God just sort things out now? Surely there's a more effective way to do this, God. Well, now Peter goes to address that in verses 8 to 10. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved. So this is the same. Don't forget, right? Don't deliberately forget this fact that with the Lord one day is a, as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with the roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned and dissolved in the earth, and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So there are two things Peter points out in these verses. One, that God is eternal in nature, and that God has an eternal plan. The first thing here poured Peter points out, is the eternal nature of God. Again, something that God has revealed to us about himself, and we were, are reminded about all over scripture. Psalm 90, before the mountains were brought forth, or forever, uh, for, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God is eternal in nature. And so God is above and outside of time. Time is a human construct, but God in his eternal nature stands above time. So God is eternally in the present tense. When he made us at the dawn of time, he formed each one of us knowing the end from the beginning. The eternal nature of God means that he stands eternally present, eternally past, eternally in the future, 
and eternally in the present. He stands above time where a 24-hour day is like a 1,000 years to him, and a 1,000 years is like a 24-hour day. Spurgeon has a a great quote in, in a sermon that he preached on this passage that helps us understand the profound meaning of the divine revelation of the great I am. All things are equally near and present to his view. The distance of a thousand years before the occurrence of an event is no more to him than would be the interval of a day. With God, indeed, there is neither past, present, nor future. He takes for his name the I am. He is the I am. He is the I am in the present. He is the I am in the past. And he is the I am in the future. Just as we say of God that he is everywhere, so we may say of him that he is always He is everywhere in space, and he is everywhere in time. So we might feel that God should return today and end all this misery, but for God, the last 6,000, 10,000 years of human existence is just a blip on the radar. God is the great I am. He is eternally present. When he was at the beginning, uh, the end was just as much a part of him as the present. So we're foolish to put God on our timetable. What might seem long to us is short to our eternal God. And the false teachers were claiming that things will just go on as they always have based on their very limited capacity of humans to understand time. And the second thing that Peter points out is that there's a reason for God's delay. He's not just randomly waiting for a good time to come back. No, God has a plan. Look at verse 9. The Lord's not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but his patience toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with the roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So here we read that God has a plan. He has an eternal plan that will come into fruition. It's a a plan to expunge the world of all the evil and all the suffering uh, in this world. And we read about this promise, his promise of coming. What is that promise? Well, God made several promises to us in scripture, but there's one great promise that is the promise under which all other promises fall. It's the great promise that helps us understand all the other promises in the Bible. And what is this great promise? Well, it's a promise that's repeated throughout Scripture. Beginning in Genesis chapter 3, God gives this promise to Satan and to Eve. And he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, and he, her seed, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And the rest of the Bible is the promise of reaching its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Jesus is that seed of Eve who crushed the head of Satan. God has a plan to save this world and his beloved children from uh, within this world, not wanting any to perish, but all of them to come to repentance. God loves this world. He loves everyone in it, not wanting anyone to perish. That's a beautiful passage about God's love for us, for everyone in it. And it breaks his heart to see the world in sin and and suffering. He loves everyone in this world, not wanting anyone to perish. But, alas, he knows that not everyone will come. And not everyone is his own. Not everyone will come to him. But many will follow their sinful nature into destruction. And Jesus taught us that this day will come like a thief in the night, as Peter tells us. Matthew 24, we read this, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, He would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. So are you ready? 
Jesus has given us this invitation. And it's an invitation today in the message of the cross. Will you either hear his voice calling to us or are your hearts going to be hardened? Just like in Jesus' day, this teaching, this invitation, this gospel message either invited people in or it hardened the hearts of those who heard it. The proud and the self-righteous became hard towards the gospel message. And the humble and the repentant found healing and peace in that gospel message. And this is the message that God loves you. God is reaching out for you this very morning. But you are a sinner. And right there, the message hits you like a ton of Brits and your son, sin is exposed or your heart is hardened and you say, I'm not a sinner, I'm a good person. No, your sin is great. And on that final day, you're going to stand before a holy God and all your deeds will be exposed. That's what Peter says. And our only hope at that point will not be that I'm more good than I'm bad. Your only hope will be the finished, completed work of Jesus Christ. Jesus died your death. He took your sins upon his shoulders and he suffered the wrath of God in your place. And if you come to Jesus in humility, confessing your sinfulness, turning from your life of self-rule, he will lift you up and give you eternal life. But if your heart is hardened toward that message, then you will stand condemned and judged according to your works, all of them, on that final day. So Jesus has an eternal plan, and he's not coming back until every one of his children and his sheep are saved. To those that come in humility and repentance, he will give them eternal life, and he won't let any one of them fall or be snatched out of his hand, and he'll ensure that they come to him. John 10, my sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they will follow me, and I will give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. So we're told in Revelation 20 what will happen on this final and great day when Christ returns in glory and in judgment and in fire. In Revelation 21, verse 1, we read, uh, verse 11, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it, that's Jesus, and from his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were open. And then another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. That's the second death. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. God has a plan. And God has made a promise that a seed of Eve would crush the head of Satan. And here is that promise reaching its fulfillment. And all of those who ever lived will stand before the throne of Jesus. Everyone will stand and give an account of their life. And everyone, great and small alike, will be judged, and everyone will be found guilty. Death and Hades will give up their dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them. That's you and me. Will be judged according to what they've done. As we stand there weeping, the judgment will fall, and each of us will stand guilty before a holy God. But two groups will be sent to two very different destinations. One, to eternally suffer in hell, and the other, to eternal life. And the difference between the two is not in what they did or didn't do. The difference is, are they in the Lamb's book of life? How does one get in there? Through faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone. 
as we stand weeping at the judgment. Our eyes will be filled with tears because we'll be found guilty. But what happens next to those who have placed their faith in Jesus? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. He'll wipe away every tear from our eyes. You were condemned. You were guilty. And you knew it. And you cried. And Jesus came and wiped those tears away. And death shall be more, no more. Neither shall be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. And that's the message of the Lamb and the cross. And this message is either softening your heart this morning or it's hardening your heart. And you have to decide. Today can be the day of salvation. Amen. Would you come to Jesus, confess your sins, and fall on his grace? Would you rest in the completed work of Christ and not your works? Rest in his goodness and not your goodness? So we see from these verses that we should not be concerned about the timing of God's plan, when and where and what, but rather we should just be ready and live today as if it would be that day. God is eternal. God has an eternal plan and his love and patience, he's waiting for the full number of people to come into the book of life. And it's conceivable that right now on earth is that last person. It's conceivable. One day there will be that one and final convert to come to Jesus in faith, and then God will close the book and say it's done. God in his loving patience is waiting for that last man or that last woman to come to him in repentance. And so as we close this morning, Peter applies this timeless truth. And here we'll dive in more next week, but it's important that you, you see the flow of where he takes this argument. Since all these things are to be so dissolved, to happen in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? To be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for hastening the coming of the day of the Lord? How do we hasten the coming of the day of the Lord? We share the gospel with the lost. Yes. That's how we hasten it. Because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn, but according to his promise, we're waiting for the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness will build. Peter makes three applications. We're going to pick it up next week. Those who have come to faith in Christ, those whose names are written in the book of life, will strive to live lives that are pure in holiness and godliness. We will be ready, waiting for the coming day of the Lord, and hopeful as we wait for this new heavens and earth. We'll dig into that next week, but you see, I want you to see how, how he immediately applies these truths on how we to live our lives today in light of that future. But as we close today, what we've studied this morning begs the question for us, are you ready? Are you ready? That was the message Jesus taught about him coming like a thief in the night. If he came back today, will you be found ready? And the good news that Jesus came preaching is that you can have assurance and salvation today, that you can stand with confidence on that final day because your sins have been atoned for. Your works will not determine your destiny. There will never be a perfect time to give your life to Christ. There's never going to be a day where you have your act together. You can come to Jesus just as you are this morning. Yes. He loves you. He's waiting for you. And the Lord loves you, not wanting anyone to perish. Won't you come to him today? He comes to you and he gives you this invitation. Truly, truly, I say, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. And he does not come into judgment, but passes from death to life. And he will wipe those tears from your eyes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing these things to us. We would never know what was going to happen at the end unless you were gracious enough to, to reveal it to us in your word, through your apostles, through Jesus, through the Old Testament. Lord, we thank you that you have not left us ignorant about what will happen when we die. You have not left us naive about what will happen at the end of time. 
but you have told us so that we might be ready. And so, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful good news that you have given us, this good news that invites us to come and follow the Lamb. Lord, let us be a church found ready and waiting. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're about to take